Pulled up to the scene in a 65 Bentley, dripped in Brioni, China doll with me, looking like a supermodel, oh what a feeling, 25 years old, 25 million, today's the audition for the Godfather part, my life's already a movie so when do I start, I walk up in Patsy's East 119th Street, Fat Tony Salerno gets a kiss on the cheek, I know my way around, not my first time here, been doing overnight cigarette loans for 10 years, I say hello to Danny Pagano and Tough Tony, Nicky Domino gives me a nod, they all know me, they ask why I'm there so early, I say the part, they say what part, I say the movie, why not, I don't look like Carlo, they all begin laughing, 3pm ready for the lights, cameras, action, Gianni getting the zone, my name is Gianni Russo, aka Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from the Godfather, I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story, welcome everybody, and it's another week that's gone by, and here we are, Gianni Russo. The lady next is Jackie Raymond. Jeannie. And my plot, Jeannie, I'm sorry, Jeannie. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry. I always wanted to be Jacqueline Smith, so okay. okay. I'll I'm tell pretty, you, there is. I'm, you're prettier than her. I met her. Yeah, much. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Jeannie Raymond. I am mean, one. Okay, please. And this, my partner, for many years now, I can't believe it. He was chasing me as a kid, as a cop, and now we're pawns right <laughs> yeah, here. I, I, I'm, I tell you, I'm going to lock you up one day. You said that 20 years ago. <laughs> hey, it, it, it wasn't really. it, I, I tried. Was that, we're talking to Paul, our guest from last week. Hi, Paul. Paul welcome to the show. Paul, Thank Paul you for having me back. back. Thank you for having okay. me back, guys. When, you want to give him a formal this, intro, please? Yes. Okay. When last we spoke, Paul, uh, uh, you had uh, told us a fascinating story about the growth of organized crime in the southwestern Pennsylvania area, specifically Pittsburgh. How they came to power, the power that they had, uh, they expanded to other states, and like anything else, uh, eventually what goes up must come down. So what we want, we wanted to have you back to finish the story. Uh, we left you uh, at the mob's peak. And now they slowly start to erode until, uh, like the dinosaurs, they basically disappeared. So start us off uh, somewhere around the peak and then start going back. I mean, I'll... You know, with, some chronologi- with some chrono- chronological dates, so our customers who, I mean, our customers, our listeners who weren't listening last week catch up with us. All right, Perfect. Will. Sure thing. Okay. okay, let me let me ask you this. Uh, well, uh, another fun fact that surprised me that uh, the Pits- Pittsburgh had uh, the biggest profitable illegal casino in the United States. Yes. How? So that was... Who told you that? I'm more per capita. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he, did but he wasn't even born with this. I mean, it, well, the it, prohibition, it, forget about it. The man's New Orleans. Research- then his book. You, know, you know the I, casino I, they had in New Orleans, Costello and all owned it. Well, French this is Corner. this is a different time. But anyway, Paul, tell us how. Oh so, yeah, so the one you're referring to uh, is a casino that was in. We've mentioned this town before in Youngstown, Ohio, um, and it was making um, at least twenty million a year. Um, and that's just off the top of my head, trying to remember that figure. Um, and basically. Uh, the gentleman I mentioned who uh, was appointing police officers in Youngstown was also running that casino. Um, and it was an illegal casino. It was uh, in, uh, you know, just one of the suburbs of Youngstown. What it year? Eventually got raided. What year? That? What year? What year? So it was in uh, like 88, 89 when it got shut down. Um, and Lenny Strollo, uh, who was headed, headed that up, ended up going to prison for just a year and a half. Um, and uh, his partners in the casino um, escaped that dragnet. Like I said, he was kind of the lead guy on it. Um, so he took, it, the, it, took the hit. How long did they operate? How many years? So with that particular casino, and this is just off the top of my head again, I think I think at least 10 years. Um, wow. it, was, it, was, it was a longer operation. And uh, and there was uh, the other gentleman who was involved in that. The other made guy in Youngstown was Joey Naples, who uh, was 
pretty infamous. Okay, this guy Strollo fascinated me. I mean, his he was way ahead of his time. His crew was multi ethnic. I mean, he didn't be yeah. it wasn't the uh, Italians. Then you could have associates. Of he just took anybody in. Uh, he was well ahead of his time. He also uh, corrupted law enforcement. Now every law, every organized crime outfit corrupts law enforcement, but he was really good at it. <laughs> yes, yes, he was. But and so were his uh, partners. Um, you know, bef before, uh, like I said, Joey Naples, he was also pretty adept at that too. Um, but Strollo, once he was the sole guy in charge in Youngstown for Pittsburgh family, um, you know, he had this big mansion in town. Um, he knew all the politicians. Uh, he was paying all the politicians. Um, he had control of the local prosecutor's office. And, uh, you know, one of the schemes they were running, they had, uh, like you said, he had a bunch of, uh, basically uh, drug dealer friends um, who were black um, and uh, they were under his Jewish associate. His name was Bernard Altshuler and uh, they called him Bernie the Jew and Bernie the Jew basically had a crew of uh, black guys who were drug dealers and hitmen under him and uh, you know, they under Strollo. combined together to uh, with under Strollo. Yeah. And uh, this was in the '90s when there probably there sounds pretty as nice many to uh, me. Italian. <laughs> That's wild. Um, and uh, you know they they own the town, and uh, this one of the scams they were running was th the drug dealers obviously get in trouble a lot for drug offenses and also murder, and so since they had that prosecutor on their side, they were basically charging whoever could afford it. $100,000 to get their charge reduced or even to get off scot-free sometimes. So Is this uh, one of the reasons he only got a year and a half? Uh, so no, I don't think so, but I think that's room. just simply because they only got him on gambling. His power back in the early 90s, late 80s was not even close to what it was in the mid-90s when he was the only guy there because his partner, Joey Naples, got murdered. So he... Uh, he was the last man standing, and after that, he he owned the town and could do things like that. He he also owned the uh, chief of police, a guy named uh, Zanakis. Yeah, yeah. So he uh, he had uh, in one of the suburbs of Youngstown, he had police chief in his pocket. Um, but even in Youngstown, he was picking picking people that he wanted to go and you know donating to their campaigns and all that. Youngstown yeah. itself. What is the uh the John Gotti fireworks shakedown. Okay. Yeah. So that was a local fireworks company, uh, in Ohio that was doing business in New York. And, uh, there was, uh, you know, allegedly that the Gambino family was trying to squeeze him for more money. So he ran to Lenny Strollo, who's a made guy in Pittsburgh for help. And, uh, you know, Lenny said, Hey, you pay me a certain amount. Um, and I'll make this uh, go this problem go away. And he did uh, make it go away. And then that guy basically had to pay him this stipend every year. I'm forgetting the exact amount, but it was a lot of money. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, the, the Gambinos and Strollo colluded in order to make that happen, you know, that's always an open question, right? Like uh, or whether it was just a scheme to make money for, Lenny Strollo from the beginning. Yeah, John, uh, John Gotti always used to have a big uh, uh, Fourth of July party every year, where he uh, had a lot of fireworks. I mean, you you could see it in all, all the five boroughs. It was it, it rivaled the Macy's Day parade, or the Macy's Day uh, Fourth of July celebration. I mean, huge. He was big into fireworks. Strollo. Well, we're talking about uh, 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 Strollo. He almost committed the cardinal sin of putting a hit on a prosecutor. Paul Gaines. I mean, yes, he did. That. So I don't think that he got permission for that, and he didn't mention any of that in because uh, later on, uh, sorry, a little bit of a spoiler. He flipped, um, and he did not mention it, that anybody gave him permission, and I don't believe they did. Michael Genovese, as we were talking about, was super low key. Um, he might have gotten, in, you know, had his family in some risky businesses like drugs, but he was a very low key mobster, old school. Doing something like that, I think, would have horrified him. And Lenny Strollo was basically, in, in my opinion, going out on a limb like a cowboy 
And what happened was uh, is that his handpicked candidate for prosecutor lost the election um, in the in the 90s, in the mid 90s. And uh, as uh, I think it was 1997, 98 rolled around, you know, they're going to swear in this new prosecutor. And uh, he orders his his uh, hitters to take this guy out before he gets sworn in. So it's uh, Christmas time. The guy's in his house. Uh, he just got home from his work. Party. Um, you know, he's getting ready to become the prosecutor for Mahoning County, which is where Youngstown is. And uh, a man walks into his garage and, and through his door while he's talking to his mom on the phone. And he shoots him. Um, he is wounded in his side. Um, and then the killer, you know, steps over him, points the gun right at his heart and pulls the trigger, but it jams and the guy panics, yeah. ends up running out the back door, uh, you know, drops a speed loader and gets in the car with his accomplices. Wow. And, you know, and they're, they're all worried because, you know, the guy <laughs> yeah, basically okay. coughs it oh. up that they, they didn't kill the guy. Um, were there and, any uh, repercussions with Trollo? Yeah, I know. That? Were, were there any repercussions ordering this hit? Yeah, there were repercussions eventually. It, it took a little bit of time, but uh, eventually one of the co-conspirators' girlfriends ratted him out uh, to the actual prosecutor who was shot. Um, she called him in the middle of the night, and he answered the phone, and he and he was amazed because she was telling all these details that he knew that, you know, she, he knew that she knew the killers basically. And so the, the FBI got involved and the, the local police and everybody. And, and, uh, they figured out finally that the mafia did it. Nobody believed that the mafia actually was trying to kill the prosecutor because it was so bungled. But, uh, and you know, they thought they were giving him a little bit too much credence. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that brought Strollo down. There are many things, but, uh, that was one of them. I'm surprised that, uh, New York didn't have something to say about this. I mean, it, it created a lot of media attention. Mm -hmm. This was by Strollo sounded like he was out of control. Uh, this was in 1996, this, this botched hit. Okay. But this, this was basically the death knell for, the, for, for, for uh, Strollo and his organization. Is that correct? It started to go down. Yeah. The, the Youngstown crew uh, basically ceased to exist after that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's still, like you said, bookies, et, et cetera, in Youngstown that, uh, no doubt about it. Um, and with maybe a little bit of organization, but, uh, the actual official presence of the family with a made guy and all that was gone after that. In Youngstown. There was a lot of convictions from his crew. Yeah. Well, a ton of people flipped, including him. Mob so. history in the United States. That's when it all started falling apart. Chicago, uh, New York. They all doing everything Paul, that you're not supposed uh, to do. Paul, yeah. let, me, let me see if I understand this. Lenny Strollo himself flipped? Yeah, Lenny Strollo himself flipped eventually. And uh, his, uh, the Bernie Altshuler, who I was talking about, who was his lieutenant, um, and a few of the, uh, the Jeff Riddle and Levance Turnage, who were his uh, black hitters and, and, Sometimes they actually ran gambling games too. Um, they stayed true to Omerta, even though they weren't made. And Lenny Strollo, the the made guy who was their boss, flipped on them um, and testified them against them in court. So, okay. uh, what, so kind of and, and what time? What got a time? Did Lenny get? Yeah. Yeah. So he only got a few years, and he was out in like. I want to say like the 2010 time frame. Sorry, that's that's a it's another date that I'm not remembering exactly. But he lived outside of prison with his family in the Ohio area for at least ten years after he got out of prison. Was he still was he involved again, or did he just retire? No, no, he was done. Um, and really, there's nothing more sure that you could say about there being no family unless they're like super low key and cautious, right? Like the fact that Lenny Strollo, who had testified against so many people, including corrupt, corrupt officials, um, that he could live out in the open in the Youngstown area still and be fine. Oh, yeah, as powerful that's what as happened. Uh, excuse me, but that, that's what happened to a lot of guys that flipped. Like you, you mentioned, 
you know, so many. I mean, even Sammy the Bull, he's out. Nobody's bothering him. Mm -hmm. All these podcast. guys that uh, I'm sorry, what? He's got a podcast. Well, I know. Yeah, now. And, and the language he uses on I can't remember <laughs> who listens to it. He and they tried to they tried to kill Sammy in like 2002. Uh, yeah. I think Peter Gotti sent some people down to Arizona to get him. Yeah. It just well, didn't of, work out. But one well, of the they didn't get him spent, across the country. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the yeah. people we sent was a Newark, New Jersey police lieutenant. Really? Uh, Wow. One of the one of the hitmen. We, we discussed this on on, on on previous shows. Now, as as powerful as the Pittsburgh organized crime organization was, their control over unions, as compared to New York, for example, where they had a lock on the unions, a lot of unions. Mm. Pittsburgh did. No, no, and that's what I found. And like, certainly there were things going on. They're not very well documented. Um, there was a scam back in the '60s that. La Rocca was accused of running with the with the Teamsters and and you know uh, like every it seemed like every mob family was involved in something with them, uh, but and they did have officers in two unions um, and who were rel rel related or associates of the family, um, but none of them were ever convicted of any crimes. It was just uh, basically the federal government came in and. Uh, cleared them out of the leadership positions they were in, and uh, you know they were they were booted out. Some of them, I think, actually got back in to some of these unions, um, but they were never convicted of anything related to it. Um, pretty small time scams. And when we think about New York and its control of unions, you think about big construction projects and oh yeah, and and they you can't control, you can't do anything without doing them. No, they it control seem like Pittsburgh had that level. They controlled everything, and if anybody got out of line, it's a famous. Attempted hit. Uh, Johnny knows more about this than I do. Of a, uh, a carpenters union. I don't know if he was the president. The, 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 the guy that got shot in, shot in the ass, Johnny. Yeah, that and, was uh, he, he. He did on the construction job of bankers and brokers. Bankers and brokers, right? It was a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, as, as soon as there was any kind of uh, rumbles of problems in the unions, and they they didn't uh, toe the line, they got taken care of. I mean. Yeah. It does does the uh, New York mob still control unions like they used to? Yes. Okay, that answers that question. Especially the concrete unions. Forget about it. <laughs> Pat, you've got to elaborate. Did you say he got shot in the ass? That's yeah. what I said. Yeah. I don't think they were. I don't think they were aiming for that spot. That's not what they were. Shot. He was running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, smart. He was running, and the shooter wasn't a good marksman. Yeah. And they never went after him again. No, there was a trial that, 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 that was a big no. deal. I think Gotti got arrested on that, no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the well, witness that was, didn't show I, again. I think that was the trial where the he third uh, trial that he got off. He paid off a jury, sixty thousand dollars. And yeah. the the juror puts the money in the bank. <laughs> I mean, he might as well have taken a check. Right. You know? Anyway, Paul, uh Thomas, Sonny, C and Cuddy. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I've heard it uh, pronounced several different ways. So, uh, Chien Cuddy, Sun Sudi, um, but we'll Gene call him Chien Cuddy is probably the closest. To no, time. no, it's just a different spelling. It's a C I A N C U T T I. How would you say that? Oh, wow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're on the downward slope now. But mm -hmm. who, was, who was this guy? So, yeah. And, and before I go into that real quick, um, like when Mike Genovese takes over, he basically institutes this street tax around the region and uh, everybody has to start paying in. Um, John LaRocca was a little bit more loose with uh, some of the gambling guys. You know, he wasn't taking a cut from everyone, not, you know, some of the smaller time operators. Mike Genovese uh, uh, reportedly wanted everybody start paying up. Um, in fact, uh, somebody I talked to said that he said, you know, like basically everybody was getting a free pass before. Now they aren't anymore. Um, you know, and then you have all those drugs and those things really uh, took the family up for a little while, a few years. And then in 1990, you know, you had a big trial and it sort of brought them low. A lot of people got arrested uh, for the drugs and because of the street taxes, all that, all the attention it grabbed. 
Um, and so the organization kind of went underground again in the nineties, except for Youngstown where there was still some, some of that more violent stuff going on, um, under Strollo. And so but the hierarchy in Pittsburgh was keeping real low key and Sonny, the guy we mentioned, uh, he was one of the most low key. Um, he was the successor to the Manorino brothers that we mentioned in the last episode. He, he was the one who ran New Kensington after they were dead. They died of natural causes. And, uh, and he was a uh, long time with the family, you know, at least since the fifties, if not before. And, and so he, uh, got made in, uh, in the mid eighties, um, under Mike Genovese. Um, and he was known for gambling. There was some reporting that he was also in on that drug dealing stuff, but he was never tried for any of that. Um, just, just reporting from the FBI informants. And then, uh, he was, uh, you know, after all those trials that happened and after the nineties and the early two thousands, he was busted for running a multimillion dollar gambling ring, um, in the Pittsburgh area, uh, football and, I and basketball betting, I think. And yeah. so he basically got probation for that. It, it was, uh, you know, a slap on the wrist type of offense. Um, there was really no, uh, violence attached to the group. You know, I, I think they had them sort of, uh, you know, saying, Hey, you better pay up, but nobody actually getting beaten up or anything like that. Um, so the case wasn't, that's the second it, time you you mentioned that these guys go to jail for a year or two. Yeah. What kind of income tax or fines are they paying? So yeah, definitely paying fines. Um, you know, some of them in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but not heavy jail time. And then the case that I'm talking about in the early 2000s, 2001, uh, 2000, 2001. But what about the income tax any jail at all? On all this millions? What about recall? What's that? What about the income tax on all these millions they made? So they definitely got in some tax trouble and had to pay, but it the amounts never seemed to jive with what with what if you do the calculations with how much they were making. And maybe that's the fact that the IRS uh, and the other federal agencies that were involved couldn't prove uh, you know, exactly how much they were making. They could only go up to a certain point and then probably couldn't prove any more than that. Um, that would be my guess. And all, they're very good at hiding their money in Pittsburgh. Um, a lot of them did it in real estate. Um, you know, people still talk about in Pittsburgh, like where did Mike Genovese hide his mil millions of dollars? You know, it's, it's like a topic of conversation among people who know about the mafia there. Why do you think there were no uh, RICO indictments? This this cries out for RICO. I mean, they, oh. they started putting people oh. away in New York in the 80s on the RICO. They decimated the, the heads of the five yeah. families. So the RICO, RICO, the 1990 trial that I keep alluding to in which Chucky Porter, that half Irish, half Italian underboss, when he got taken down, that was a RICO case. Oh, that was? Um, okay, it wanna, was uh, well, let's, RICO let's, gambling and drugs. Okay, let's take a break here. John, you want to take us to a commercial? Okay. We're taking a break. We'll be right back. And you better show back up because we know where you live. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. I'm happy to say Hollywood Godfather, Rob Ography, is now playing on most platforms. Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music. Listen to Joel Ortiz, famous rapper, and Arsenic the Heat record. Multi-platinum producer for Sony. Produced this record. I'm proud of it. There's 12 tracks. You gotta listen to this. You never know who you're lying in a room with So I broke a broomstick in half and let it groove with The concrete in the bathroom floor It had a new tip stashed it behind the toilet In case I ever had to use it All right, we're back Okay, uh, uh, Paul, more about this guy Charles Porter He seems to be like a very powerful guy that never seemed to go away I mean, he was around a long time Yeah, so so he was uh, under, under the Manorinos at the beginning um, when he was coming up, uh, Kelly Manorino specifically. So he was with the new Kensington group. Um, he was well known in the sixties and the seventies as a kind of a leg breaker. Um, somebody who ran gambling clubs, um, drug dealer. He was a mailman at a certain point in time for a little while. 
Um, that's a mix. That's a mix. <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh, he was a mailman in the ice cream truck for a while. <laughs> he, he, he wanted a civil service job so we can get a secure pension. <laughs> there's no he didn't more last too long as a mailman, from what I understand. Correct so. me if I'm wrong, but there's no 401ks in the mafia, right? Hey, those no. have good insurance. You needed that. It's getting shot at. Our, ours, our, our 401ks, as I know, is cash. Yeah, yeah, K for cash and well uh, hidden. <laughs> Porter, Porter eventually goes to prison and gets betrayed while he's in prison. So he actually gets betrayed uh, prior to that. So one of his proteges is this guy named Joey Rosa, whose uh, father and grandfather were actually made members of the Pittsburgh Mafia. So he was kind of like a mafia prince, uh, somebody who was just expected to go into the business. And he started to, he was uh, basically in, in Porter's drug uh, drug ring. Um, and and uh, Rosa was not made, uh, but he was making a lot of money for the family. Um, he pulled off this insurance scam with a jewelry store he owned. And uh, that generated a lot of a lot of income, a few hundred thousand dollars for the family. Um, so he was in their good graces after that. And they said that, hey, you're under our protection now, um, especially because- $200,000 was a dollars a lot of money for these people to make. I make for that an, deal with for it. a new associate. Yeah, yeah. For, wow. for a new associate. Um, yeah. what year was that? That was mm -hmm. in the early 1980s. Is yeah. when it started coming up. Wow. Well, Thanks for asking that. I keep forgetting about the dates. So what? Um, what, became, what became of Porter? So Joey Rosa gets arrested uh, eventually for the the coke dealing that he's doing and. Uh, he doesn't want to go to prison for 10, 20 years. So he flips on Porter and really Porter's past history with all the drugs uh, that he was involved in on the 70s, 80s and continuing into when he was a member of the, the top hierarchy. Um, it just made him very vulnerable. And so uh, not just Joey Rosa, but a lot of other people flipped and they testified at his trial. Um, if you guys are familiar with uh, Phil Leonetti, the underboss of the Philly family, Sure. He well, even he testified at his uh, Porter's trial too, because Porter and him had met um, uh, during a sit down in in the eighties. Uh, so, uh, Gianni, what, was wasn't Leonetti a boss? He was the Philadelphia underboss under Scarpo. Yeah, he 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 he, he testified for the government. You're saying. Yeah, he flipped on his uncle. Uh, and then after that, he kind of did a tour around the United States testifying against other figures, too. That's a good way to put it, a tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What if he had a travel agent? <laughs> and he had the witness protection program. <laughs> Gianni, do you know these names? I know some of them, yeah. Yeah, I know some of them. Yeah, but... Uh... Uh, Porter eventually... Uh, what became of him? Is he still around? So he went to prison in uh in 1990 and he was in prison um for uh like about 10 years um and during that time uh he did develop some health problems and uh the fbi kept basically reaching out to him in prison and saying hey work with us work with us and so he he did finally work with them and he was basically not a government witness where you're going to go and you're going to testify to trial he was an undercover informant in prison um, and all the guys that he w was meeting in prison from other families, basically talking shop around him. And, uh, and, you know, he was feeding some of that stuff to the Bureau. And somehow his family was all, I never really figured out how, but his own family was also getting to him in prison and talking to him and telling him about some of the stuff that was going on back home. And he would also feed that to them. Um, he had his, t his, uh, information according to the FBI, ended up saving uh, five or six people from getting uh, hit, including Joey Rosa. Uh, Joey Rosa was supposedly going to come back and visit his, some of his relatives in Pittsburgh, and the family knew about it, and they were going to take him out. And uh, Porter told the FBI about that, and they, they were able to stop it. So was his um, uh, sentence eventually reduced? Yeah, so he got uh, over 25 years when he was convicted at trial, and uh, he only was in for 10 and uh the and he got out and he lived until 2016 and 
he's another one just like Strollo who was living. He, Porter was actually living in the exact same house he had when he was the underboss. Oh, the old, wow. That's yeah. Amazing. And uh, so he's dead now. Um, but uh, his, his son is a lawyer and his wife's still alive. Um, so he still has family in the area. Why? Why was this? Uh, this family, uh, the organized crime uh, in its entirety, allowed to die. Of course, uh, uh, C. and Cuddy, for lack of a better explanation, he was the last made man. And he died. That was it. When did he die? He died in 2021. So pretty recently, uh, I think it's oh, July wow. of 2021. Um, and according to some guys I've talked to after the book came out, that's the funny thing about writing a book. Like all these people come out of the woodwork and they're like, yeah, exactly. hey, yeah. you should talk to me. And I was like, well, I didn't know you were around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so those people tell me that he had respect in Youngstown still. He was still respected in Pittsburgh. People still, uh, you know, he still had associates working for him doing scams and schemes here and there, um, according to these people. Um, but, you know, once again, his last conviction was in 2001, 2000, 2001. So he was flying under the radar. You know, if, if I had a guess, it'd probably just be doing gambling and, and that's it and keeping it low key. But, but- but he was the last made guy. Yes. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Genovese died at 87. Yep. In and 2006. Halloween 2006. So, you know, exactly. Uh, what is that? Oh, well, last night. <laughs> 17, 17 years ago. I'm talking about Halloween. Yep. <laughs> 17 years ago, last night. Okay. The, uh, uh, that the Pittsburgh organization from uh, start to finish lasted 90 years. They had seven bosses. None mm-hmm. died in prison. None, none of them died in prison. No. Yeah. They're, they're uh, the Pittsburgh FBI and the and law enforcement were never able to pin anything on a Pittsburgh boss that sent them away for a long time. The only prison term that, Heavy served was uh, six months in uh, a local prison in Pittsburgh, where basically for not testifying, they had granted him immunity during this uh, uh, testimony about the local rackets, and uh, he declined to testify. Obviously, and they sent him to prison to try to get him to testify, and so uh, he wouldn't. W- would you consider this a testimonial to the tight organization, poor law enforcement, or nobody gave a damn because? I mean, you become a boy. Nobody wants to be a boss in New York, and they put a target on your back. They're generally mm-hmm. getting to Italy now, uh, but that's another story. Uh, why do you think that none of these guys died in prison? I mean, why they weren't targets? So in the specific case of Genovese himself, uh, he was super careful, and he only acted through people he trusted greatly. Um, so only Porter at a certain point, and, you know, Z- Zatola, Henry Zatola, who we mentioned with the casino. Um and a few other people that he met with, and that's it. And uh, Porter did flip, but Porter also, and this is where the luck comes in, Porter lied during his trial many times because he was, you know, at that time he was just a defendant. Um, but that basically made him unusable on the stand. So that's why they only had him as an undercover informant. And so the fact that Porter's lied on the stand actually probably saved his boss from being indicted. Let me ask you a question. Well, you, we're mentioning that they 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 retire. They no, how many of them? Were, none of them were gunned down as bosses. And so, I, in the early days, uh, there were people who were uh, murdered, uh, especially during Prohibition era. Well, that's what um, I'm there, talking about. To run a family for ninety years. Yeah, exactly. That was amazing. Of, yeah. Non unnatural causes. That's insanity. Yeah, no. So, so a few of them did get hit in the early days, but nobody ever died in prison. So, what uh, is your opinion of the state of organized crime in this area presently? So, based on what, uh, like, some of those people that I tell you that I talked to after the book, um, they've shed some light on that. I think that there are. Probably small 
small groups of gamblers who had ties to the old guys who were made and some associates who were just a big deal and, you know, probably were acted like they were made. Um, they're still hanging around and they're still doing business and they're making money. And, uh, they Probably have bookmakers respect. and Shylock isn't just yeah. that kind of stuff, just to make yep. a small living. But what I've been told is that there's just nobody in the background, like organizing you know, it. Yeah. yeah, like there's no Don keeping no. everything together. You know, as as far as uh, uh, people that that that, that want to go in, into gambling, uh, Joker poker machines, uh, any, any kind of gambling machines, every bar in this area has one, at least one. Anybody that wants to put one in, puts one in. If somebody comes in off the street and says, look, I can put in a Joker poker machine, you know, not the owner, just somebody walks in off the street and says, I want to put a Joker poker machine. They work a private deal between the two of them, and that's it. You try that in New York, and you're going to you're gonna have a problem. Uh, here, there's nobody mm -hmm. to enforce anything. Well, we're still organized here in New York. That's why. I know, very okay. organized. Yeah. Uh, uh, Look at the population of that town towards New York City. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, aside from drugs, uh, you know, which is a, a, just a whole other topic. If you want to go in, in, into the gambling business in Southwestern PA, you can hang out your shingle tomorrow. You're in it. I mean, I know, I know friends of my of my sons who, in, instead of going to college, are bookies. Uh, own gambling machines, put them in bars. They're doing very well. Uh, no one stops them. They can do whatever they want to do. Hmm. Which is kind of amazing, giving the uh, like the competition now because now it's legal there. And I think there's even a casino in Greensburg where like yeah. that area where you kind of live. Yeah, it's it's called uh, it's called Live. Uh, I've, I've been there. Yeah. I've been there a couple of times. Yeah, uh, great small casinos live in a lot. Well, the, well, this areas. casino is, is huge. Uh, you know who Guy Fieri is, the, the cook. He's got a whole bunch of shows on the, on the Food Channel. He's got a mm -hmm. restaurant. There's a bunch of high end restaurants in there. But the, you know, it's it's the same old thing. You gamble in a casino, and you're subject to state yeah. tax, income tax. So bookies, uh, I mean, these kids, and they are kids. They're in their early twenties. Some of them, they're doing really well. <laughs> they're, they're raking in a lot of money. Everybody gambles around here because there's really not much else to do. <laughs> uh, I mean, as far as as far as entertainment, no, there's nothing here. Yeah, uh, you, you would have to go to Pittsburgh for the nightlife. You know what there is of it. Uh, is that why a lot of them become writers? <laughs> I, well, I, I mean, the only thing I've I ever wrote before I came here was a shopping list. I said I have to keep myself busy. You know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Fun. You get boys. Yeah. Gonna, what takes a lot of time, and I can, you know. A living, <laughs> uh, or, or you know what I said? You know what I did? I just moved here, and I said I have to find a guy who really knows the mob, was a movie star, and uh, is famous. And then, you, then you popped up, and the rest is history. Well, you didn't get any of that from me. <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's quiet towns, but there's always sports are really big. Sports betting is is huge uh, around here. Uh, and, People sit in front of these things all day and just pump money in. Mm -hmm. Wow. I've got a question for you, Paul. Now, you said they were a little bit into basketball. I'm a kind of a podcast junkie because I always have to have something going in my ear. And I was just listening to one talking about um, basketball, uh, playing off basketball players and stuff like that. Is that some of what went on there? So... To uh, to a certain extent, so there was uh, uh, there was a point shaving scandal um, that was connected to Henry Hill. Yeah, uh, it, and uh, you guys have probably heard about that. Maybe we talked about that on here. But one of the guys that was helping out with that was the Pittsburgh guy, Paul Maisie, who was associated with the Pittsburgh connection, Nick the Blade. Um, so that's really the only one that I heard of where a Pittsburgh guy was involved in something like that. It doesn't, it, if it was happening, there isn't a lot of evidence of it. And unfortunately for Pittsburgh, that's a lot of, they were so secretive that, uh, you know, I have this part at the end of my book, it's called Unsolved. It's just a few of the bigger unsolved crimes from the, from the mob days. And, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of murders that nobody really knows who, killed these people um because 
they were they were very good at uh killing someone and 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 getting rid of the evidence uh even if even if they left the body in the street nobody knows who did it yeah every now and then uh they pull up an old skeleton out of, out of a river here nobody knows who the hell it is I mean, was, I mean the, the killings were just you know like I said at, at the subtle last week show per capita the mob murders here were just unbelievable uh just so many of them Thank yeah, and know. that was something that. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. Right, go ahead. That was something that, uh, if you if you know the name Al Diarco, he was a Lucchese sure. uh, hierarchy Good guy, out. who who eventually flipped because uh, a Muso and Queso were going to kill him, um, and he had connections to Pittsburgh. He was related to one of the guys in the one of the older guys who lived until uh, the late eighties. His name was Joe Sica. And Joe Sika actually wanted Al Arco to be in a Pittsburgh family, but Al Arco decided to wait until he would get into New York because he he obviously is from New York, so he liked New York. But uh, he knew a lot about Pittsburgh because of that, and he said that uh, you know if you messed up in Pittsburgh, you were going to end up in the Monongahela River. So it doesn't surprise me that that they would be pulling bodies out of there because that was supposedly where they dumped a lot of people. Yeah, this area for the people who aren't aware, uh, there's a there's Three rivers, seventy-three bridges, uh, oh. going to Pittsburgh. Seventy-three bridges. You can't walk twenty feet without coming to a bridge. So there's always water to cross here, and it's a great dumping ground. You know. So anyway, uh, we we between last week and this week, we went from A to Z. You uh, you're a hell of a storyteller, Paul. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about what you're doing now, where uh, uh, our listeners can find you, web pages, whatever you have. Listen. Sure. Wait, let me ask you my question first, uh, real quick, Paul. You mentioned the black handers earlier. So will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, okay. sure. It's just the the early Italian uh organized crime activity. It's what it was called before the mafia. Um a lot the groups were a lot smaller. Um it started out in New Orleans and then kind of spread across the country into even little small steel towns. Um, in the Pittsburgh area. And uh, it was before organized crime was truly organized. You know, it was organized on that town level. And they would uh, prey upon Italian immigrant communities. You know, if you remember that scene from Godfather 2, where, you know, there's, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but there's the guy that Vito kills. He has a white suit on to take over that part of New York. Manoosh, Manoosh, that's right. Yeah. 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 So he was a he. I see him as like the black hander, like he was a, yeah, kind of he alone. Definitely was. That's what yeah. they were, they were trying to show that, because yes. I mean that that was the biggest problem, which most people don't even know, that uh, the man they sent from Sicily, who was seventeen years of age at the time, was Carlo Gambino. They made him over there to come over here and straighten that out, and he did. The black hand just preyed on other Italians. Yep. yep. That was that was that thing. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. nobody spoke stopped. English. That's what right after that, Maranzano, and and that's when they stopped those two families and created the five families and organized it. So Paul, uh tell us where uh our listeners can find you. Sure. Um so um I'm on Facebook. Um and uh I've got uh, an affiliation with this site that was uh, started by a friend of mine, um, and it's called Pittsburgh Mob on Facebook. And uh, so just look up Pittsburgh Mob, and you can see some of the posts I make, and the other members make posts too. And if you want to learn more of the backstories from the book that I didn't wasn't able to get to, you can find a lot of that there in the old posts. And I'll keep continue posting stuff that I find. Um, so you can find me there, and then as I said, you can find. Um, my book, Steel City Mafia, Blood Betrayal, and Pittsburgh's Last Dawn, and Amazon, or and and in Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, you can find it at Barnes and Noble and some local bookstores too. There's so, three books out you have. Yeah, no. so there is also an audiobook, and there's a Kindle version of it too. So there's an electronic version and an audiobook of it too, um, which is great. And uh, the audiobook just actually came out. You could find that on audiobooks.com and many other places too, wherever you can find audiobooks. And uh, it's, uh, I, I, I did write another book. It was about World 
for a while called the Kaiser's Lost Cruiser, but that was about four or five years ago. I'm also a military history nut, so true crime and military history, that's my thing. There you go. Two corrupt, two corrupt organizations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you know, uh, thank you very much. You've been a great guest. This no, man, you have really very enlightening. Yeah, extremely. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and I, I, for one, and I'm very picky with, uh, 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 you know, one thing about being a, a writer, and you can attest to this, Paul, you're very mm-hmm. critical of, of books. You always look, I mean, you, your yeah. eyes automatically catch mistakes, research mistakes. Uh, I would have done this better than, than this. I would have wrote, wrote it this way. I really, really enjoyed your book. It was such a pleasure to read. And uh, I, I strongly recommend it to our listeners. That's high praise. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you. We appreciate you, Paul. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Right. I guess and we you. are a wrap. And we'll find Paul again when he writes something else that we want to talk about. Okay, right. but oh, good night, Paul. Good night, Gianni, and good night, Hi. Good night, good night, good night everyone. Good night. Nice to meet you, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Right. Nice Bye-bye. to meet you too. Okay. Bye-bye. Until next week. God bless. Bye. And that was that. And I'll be back. Thank you for tuning in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. Do you have a question for the mailbag? We love hearing from our fans and answering questions about past or future episodes, your favorite celebrities, or anything you'd like to know. Submit your questions online at hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com or you can call us at 646-776-3038 and leave us a message. Who knows, your question may even make it on the air. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and at Real Gianni Russo. If you like our show and you like what we're doing, please leave us a review on your podcast or video streaming service. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Now we'll be back next week with a new exciting show and who knows who may be joining us. Until next time. I never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back. Seventeen, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls and soft summer nights. We'd hide from the light on the village green. I didn't mind